This is the, vic the, the victimization rate in homicide from the supplementary homicide report. And what you see Uh, the peak, if you follow that peak down, and th those are the uh, African American kids from 15 to 24, and then if you follow that line down at, at 19, 1980, they're the second graph. Those are the kids lower huh? homicide risk. Then as they got involved in the crack market, that curve goes up and, and peaks rather considerably at about two or two and a half times what it was previously when it was reasonably flat. The, the African American adults uh, were reasonably low and then came down themselves starting in 1983, 1993. But the kids really peaked, and they were a major factor in that uh, homicide conviction and uh, victimization. In 2015, we started with an issue that started to go against the, the, the grain that we had been seeing. Murder was up by 11.8%. One of the largest increases in a year in, in murder. That has been one of the political themes that's been raised. Look at the rise in homicide uh, going on. So we've reached a, a level of homicide that we hadn't seen before. It wasn't that we had reached a level of homicide. The change, you will note, is not a dramatic change, but it is a dramatic increase in part because the rate is as low as it was at the time. Uh, and, and robbery went up uh, by 1.7%. And then uh, let, let's look at 2016. Murder went up again by a rather large increase, 8.4%, and robbery up by 5.5%. So we did see some significant increases from the admittedly low rate, and, and when you look at it, you can see that it's still not terribly dramatically high, but the increase was sizable. Let me the, the most recent report we have from the Uniform Crime Reports was for the first half of 2017. And that was murder up by 1.2%, relatively small now, uh, and robbery up by, robbery down by 2.2%. So it looks like there's a reduction, and I'll say some more about some of those trends. The recent rise in murder, uh, we talked about the increase, and uh, most of that rise was in big cities. Chicago alone accounted for 20.3% of the national rise in 16. And, and in 17, some up, but mostly down. And the use of, I told you about the UCR 2017, Brendan projects for the year to be down 2.7%. What you have here is the murder rate in, in uh, 30 top cities, and, and what you see is uh, the, the changes. You see a, some of those changes are quite large. For example, Chicago had an increase between 2015 and 16. I'm now looking at the last column here. This is a, a listing of the murder rate and the number of murders by city. But, but I want to highlight I want to highlight where some of the shifts were large, 60% up in Chicago and 59% in San Antonio, but it had a smaller rate, and 57% in uh, 
San Jose. I've also included here among the, the, the top 30 cities, those cities that had uh, more than 100 murders. That, that, that's where the, the attention was warranted. And, and again, the big ones were Detroit, Washington, I'm sorry, Louisville and Detroit, and Memphis were, were the largest growth. What we have here is the 2014 to 17 change, that, that does three years. And what we see is, for example, in Chicago, a 64% increase. In San Antonio, 27% increase, 38% in Dallas, and uh, among the lesser cities, lesser uh, below the top 10, uh, a big increase in Charlotte, big increases in, in Columbus and Louisville, and big increases in Memphis and Baltimore. So you have a sense of the variation, and, and you have a sense of the increases and decreases. What I have here is uh, the percent change from 16 to 17, and you'll notice in the top 10 largest, all of them are in red, which is a decrease. In, the, in, in 216 to 17, what you see is, again, a, a big increase in Charlotte, and a big increase, a big increase in Charlotte, and a big increase in Columbus, but the rest are predominantly red. So the 16 to 17, we're seeing a recovery in many respects across the cities. So there was a large percentage rise in 15 and 16, mostly in the large cities. The, two, the, the 17 murder rate in the 30 larger cities was estimated to decline by 5.6% reasonably undoing, but by no means totally undoing the rise in the previous two years. New York City continues to be an astonishingly an astonishing place for the nation's largest city where, her, where homicide is greatest. Uh, as the country was moving under 5%, New York is still around 3%. It's been an impressive effort. Some cities are still projected to see their mur murder, rate, murder rate rise, including Charlotte and Baltimore. The overall crime rate in most of the 30 largest cities in 2017 is estimated to decline from 16 by falling by 2.7%, according to these Brennan estimates, derived from individual city reports rather than waiting for the UCR, which won't be out until September or so. And the, the idea of carnage and the nationwide crime wave is just simply inconsistent with the data of what we've seen. We've seen lots of declines, fairly stable, a, a bump the last few years, but seeming seems to be being underdone, undone. And the two tough on crime policies are not what's called for, and the aggressive drug treatment seems to be inappropriate. Okay, but let's let's see some speculations about why the homicide rate. It's crying for explanations, and, and there's no strong explanation for the rise and decline. It's clear that there's no uniform explanation that covers all the cities. Uh, different indications from different cities. So what we have now are mostly speculations. The sharp rise has not been attributable. The sharp a, sh a sharp rise has most often been attributable to either a drug war with battle between sellers and buyers and across sellers fighting for territory. 
but the, they're still important and by no means uh, as dominant as uh, they had been in the, uh, particularly in the 80s and 90s. Deep policing, uh, police backing off uh, on the uh, on enforcement, uh, too often called a Ferguson effect, um, much more often, uh, much more appropriately, I think, called a uh, South Carolina's North South Charleston effect, where, where the police were, that there was a lot of uh, vi videos of police shootings, particularly of black men, and, and uh, uh, the, the one in, in South Carolina was the, the, the uh, man stopped for a traffic offense running away and the police shot him on, on a video. Uh, it, it, it certainly, no, the, the notion of uh, citizen veto videos uh, documenting a police shooting unarmed uh, people. I speculated about two and a half years ago, speculated, I uh, had a long interview with the bureau chief of New York Times in Chicago, and they, they, were, they had a uh, brand new story on the front page about violence decline, particularly homicide decline, in a number of cities. And I had that interview said something about, well, police may be backing off because they're seeing all the videos that are capturing them and, and they don't want to be caught. So I, and, and there was a one-liner that said uh, a, a change in the equilibrium between police and uh, criminals. And uh, I got a whole bunch of media calls the next day. I'm not sure it was because of uh, the ubiquitous uh, phenomenon that the Times was reporting or, or whether it was the crypticness of uh, a, a, a change in the equilibrium. Uh, but a few months later, Comey, uh, then the, the head of the FBI, who had been out in police departments, reported that police departments were facing these changes. And it's been very tough to document, so, so that, uh, that that's certainly an important possibility. And, uh, others are going to try to get a handle on whether that's happening. One of the reports I've gotten from uh, police departments is that we're seeing the presence of much more powerful guns. Multiple rounds, uh, larger magazines, converting uh, what was likely to have been a one-shot uh, one hit somewhere in the body to a multiple shots in the body with a greater probability of it being a homicide, therefore, rather than merely an aggravated assault with some injuries. So that, uh, uh, and, and that's easy to uh, document by looking at the number of bullet holes in the uh, bodies that are sent into the morgue. It's very likely local causes, local factors are going on there and I think Rick, in his uh, next presentation, will we'll talk about some of those possibilities that he's identified. But, but there doesn't seem to be a common national phenomenon as there was in the, particularly in the 80s and the early 90s, uh, which was very much stimulated by violence within the drug market. Okay. Uh, let's examine approaches to limiting gun firepower restriction for automatic weapons and limited access to the larger magazines that's been talked about after all of the shootings like the one uh, the other day uh, and not much progress has emerged yet and I don't know what will move the political process to worry about that aspect. Proactive policing has become much more the thing for police in, in terms of targeting uh, hot spots in terms of individual risk prediction, whether it be individuals as victims of crimes that are retaliating, or whether it's tracking individuals who are seen to be high risk. Uh, but but so we're seeing police much more targeted at crimes that they might intervene with, and the aggressive uh, that the aggressive deterrence as 
a program that had been picked up in a number of cities of bringing in together the gangs, the individuals who are, who, the, the groups who are likely to be seen as major contributors to the violence and targeting them and indicating a joint responsibility uh, to the extent that they can through the law. And reentry program, which you heard about at lunch, we clearly have to do so much more, and many of the states are indeed do, doing more, to, to deal with the people who have uh, committed crimes, and there is so much more that could be done, uh, and it's a matter of committing resources to getting them into a favorable situation for, for reentry and don't send in the feds that isn't likely to address the problem nor uh, provide much in the way of solution and it's clearly going on in the cities and in the states much more aggressively than uh, the rhetoric coming up out of washington would suggest and uh, i'm open to comments and suggestions but my sense is those are going to be held till later and let's move on thank you Al. Thank you, Al. And uh, before Richard comes up, I just wanted to mention one of the things in Chicago that has happened um, is that historically there were three major gangs responsible for drug distribution in the city. There are 85 zip codes in Chicago, and those were primarily in six of the zip codes uh, where most of the, the, uh, the drugging uh, was taking place. Through RICO, they were able to make several arrests and knock out the heads of those three major gangs in the city. And it fractured the apparatus of the gangs into, instead of being three major uh, locations throughout the city, it almost became a block by block uh, gang enforcement. And so the turf wars that broke out as a result of that um, were highly responsible for a lot of the shootings and so much of the retaliation that took place because it, instead of being three major areas uh, where the drug supply was taking place, it became hundreds. And so um, the gang warfare that broke out over the last five or six years uh, has been highly uh, responsible for a lot of that that has taken place. Um, we did have a, a drop in um, homicides uh, last year, as uh, Al just mentioned, and as Richard, I'm sure, is going to talk about as well. But uh, let's bring Richard up, who is going to uh, talk to us uh, about um, his, his findings. He is the, uh, the founder of Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Good afternoon. I'm going to pick up on a theme that Al left us with, and that is this question of so-called deep policing. And so uh, I want to say that uh, uh, this has been a major narrative, uh, largely untested, about um, uh, why we might have seen a, such an abrupt increase in homicide post-South Carolina or post-Ferguson. And uh, the idea, as Al suggested, is that uh, for fear of uh, increased legal liability or having their identity spread over all over social media. The police in many cities have drawn back from fully engaged uh, enforcement and that's resulted in a crime increase, uh, homicide specifically. Joel Wallman and I um, took a couple of months out of our life and compiled relatively detailed arrest data for 53 of the largest cities. And I'm going to very briefly summarize uh, what we did and some of our preliminary results here. I'll be happy to elaborate during our discussion or in private conversation. I'll continue to call it the Ferguson effect. I think Al's right. Other incidents clearly played in, uh, but uh, controversial incidents of police use of deadly force, largely against African Americans. Um, the uh, cause the police, according to this argument, and its major proponent uh, is Heather McDonald, the famous polemicist from the Manhattan Institute here in New York. Uh, and uh, 
the argument is uh, that uh, controversial instance police force caused the police to draw back, caused homicide to go up, to put it very simply. The evidence is spotty and anecdotal, I should say until now, and uh, I, I think it's reasonably certain that in Baltimore, perhaps also in Chicago, where we did see police activity plummet after controversial incidents there, uh, those declines uh, corresponded with homicide increases. Now that doesn't, you know, that doesn't establish a causal effect, but at least the timing seems right. But as far as I know, for no other city has any such analysis been done. Uh, so we looked at the relationship between homicide rates and arrest rates uh, in large cities between 2010 and 2015, the first year in the most, uh, the year in which homicides uh, increased the most. Um, we use arrest rates as our measure of police activity because that's the only measure of police activity we have uh, for an appreciably large number of cities, and we divide arrests into several different categories. What we find? We found that uh, there are uh, declining arrests for violent crime, weapons offenses, and minor offenses are not associated with a homicide increase in our sample. We did find that falling property crime arrests were significantly related to, a homicide, to the homicide increase in cities, but uh, specifically and exclusively in cities with larger African American or black populations. That's a finding that is in search of a good explanation, and maybe we'll come up with one during discussion. Here are the claims. Al mentioned uh, former FBI Director Comey's comment. Here's the comment. This is the chill wind. Um, part of the explanation he thought was a chill wind blowing through American law enforcement and that wind is surely changing behavior. Police officers evidently told him, we feel like we're under siege and we don't feel much like getting out of our cars. Your mayor, Rahm Emanuel, we allowed our police department to get fetal, he said, uh, in uh, words that I'm sure he would have taken back had he had that opportunity. Um, and it's having a direct consequence. They've pulled back from the ability to interdict. They, want, they don't want to be a news story. They don't want their career ended early, and it's having an impact. And then Heather McDonald's so-called Ferguson effect. She attributes the increase to virulent anti-cop rhetoric after Ferguson. Uh, the police, as a result, began to engage from proactive policing, and by that, we suspect that could include a lot of things, but perhaps especially arrests for relatively minor offenses, where the police have a little bit more discretion. If they're gonna pull back, it seemed to us that would be where they would. A bloodbath ensued and its victims were virtually all black. Civilized urban life may once again break down, she wrote. Only two studies that we're aware of uh, shed much light on this arrest uh, um, crime or homicide relationship. And even in those studies, we don't have good causal evidence. We just have the coincidence of declining police arrests and increasing homicide. So we, take, we took these claims that were made and we turned them into research hypotheses. Uh, the, uh, pr you know, the kind of prior issue is what happened to homicide rates? Well, as we already saw, they rose in the big cities after police, the police killing in Ferguson. Uh, we need to confirm that. If they didn't rise, then there's, then there's nothing to study with respect to de-policing. Uh, and arrest rates declined after Ferguson, and particularly uh, pro, so-called proactive arrests for minor offenses like vandalism, drunkenness, disorderly conduct, suspicion, and so loitering, and so forth. Uh, but it's the increase, the increase in homicide, according to these dominant this dominant narrative. Uh, was a result of the decrease in arrest after Ferguson. And at the very least, what that should mean is we should see the largest increase in homicide in cities with the largest drop in arrests, perhaps especially arrests for minor crimes. 
Um, and it does seem to us uh, plausible, given uh, the focus of this narrative on tensions between the African-American community and local police department, that the relationship between homicide and arrest, if it exists at all, may well be stronger in economically disadvantaged cities with large African-American populations. So did homicide rates rise after Ferguson? We've seen the evidence. Here's a little bit more. Uh, these are homicide rates from 2010 to 2015 in 53 large cities, all of which had at least 20 homicides in 2014. So we've got relatively stable percentage changes here. Uh, and as Al pointed out, uh, we saw a nationwide increase of uh, just under 12% in 2015. For the big cities, the increase was 15.6%. Uh, did arrest rates drop after Ferguson? And again, we're looking at arrests for drug offenses, violent offenses, property offenses, weapon offenses, which are primarily unlawful use of a firearm, felon in possession of a firearm, and minor offenses that I mentioned, suspicion, curfew, loitering, disorderly conduct, vandalism, and drunkenness. Those are the major categories of arrest. Well, those are the trends in arrest per capita uh, over uh, the 2010 to 2015 period for our 53 city sample. And uh, we've noted there, uh, you know, when Ferguson occurred, it was in August of 2014, and as you can see, especially in the drug arrest category, the property arrest category, and in the minor crime category, arrests were coming down after Ferguson. But as you can also see, they were going down before Ferguson. In other words, arrests for, uh, in the aggregate for these cities were declining before the Ferguson effect as well as after the Ferguson effect. Uh, so, Prima facie, that's not strongly consistent with the argument that it was the Ferguson effect that reduced arrests. We don't see much evidence of a more precipitous drop in arrests after Ferguson than before, at least through 2015. So the homicide spike was real. I mean, for a while there was a debate in the press about whether it was mythical. No, it was real. Uh, it's not a media creation, and as Al pointed out, uh, current indications are it may well be time limited. The largest percentage increase uh, uh, in homicide occurred in 2015, the largest percentage increase in a single year since 1968. Arrest rates did drop, but the declines <coughs> began several years before Ferguson. So, was the increase in homicide related to the drop in arrests? I'm not, I'm 53 cities, I've mentioned the sample. We, we have arrest rates, we have the total arrest rates and race-specific arrest rates. You know, in our analysis, uh, we have some variables in there, an index of economic disadvantage uh, characterizing each city, uh, index of Hispanic immigration, uh, the percent of the population African-Americans, sworn officers, police officers per 100,000. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on our methods. Happy to talk, always happy to talk about methods. Uh, but basically, this is a regression analysis um, in which we are regressing homicide rates on arrest rates and those other variables. And then we engage in some sensitivity tests. We particularly want to know whether one or two cities are driving any particular result. In a nutshell, here's what we found. We found no impact, no significant impact of minor arrests, not significant, not significant, not significant. You see at the bottom there. Uh, now, uh, in the unconditional model, those are just the arrest rates and uh, their relationship to homicide rate. In the conditional models, we asked, basically asked the question through interaction terms, whether the impact of the arrest, change in arrest on change in homicide was greater in cities with larger black populations or in cities with more economic disadvantage. And in the case of weapon arrest, we do find a relationship, but it's positive. Fewer rep weapons arrests, fewer homicides. More weapons arrests, more homicides. Crime attracts arrests. It's not simply the case that arrests may 
influence crime. Um, so this is for the homicide rate and the total arrest rates. As you can see, we don't find much evidence at all of, um, at least as measured through the rest, uh, depolicing associated with an increase in homicide. When we look at the race-specific arrests, one finding changes, and that is, you see that little minus sign for property crime in the model that looks at the impact for cities with larger black populations. The minus sign means a negative relationship. In other words, as property crime arrests are going down, homicides tend to increase. Uh, you'll see that uh, for the drug category, we omitted the city of St. Louis, my own city. Um, with St. Louis in the sample, we get a significant effect for the decline in drug rests on the increase in homicide. That effect is an artifact of the inclusion of the sample of the single city, St. Louis. Here are black arrest rates and their relationship to homicide rise, and we find the same thing a negative relationship between property crime uh, and um, uh, the uh, homicide in, uh, increase. And in this case, two cities, Baltimore and St. Louis, drove results both in the weapon and in the drug category. And with those cases removed, there are no significant results. I'm, uh, in the interest of time, this is just a graph showing our results. I'm not gonna spend time there. Uh, so most of the arrest results are not statistically significant. We did find a significant effect, uh, negative effect, uh, for property crime arrests, um, and we found that relationship exclusively for cities with larger African American populations. We found a significant relationship for white property arrests, both before Ferguson and after Ferguson. In other words, if you go back before 2014, we see a significant impact on declining white property crime arrests, increasing homicides. The significant relationship, however, between declining property crime arrests and black, uh, uh, among blacks and homicide does not take hold or begin until 2014, the year of Ferguson. So we find at best, partial support for the depolicing de hypothesis, but we don't find it where we were ex led to expect it to exist. We thought it would show up in the minor crime arrests. Police are drawing back from those in particular, and that's boosting homicide. We didn't find that to be the case. Keep in mind, as I mentioned, that this relationship between homicide and arrests, crime and arrests generally, is bidirectional. Fewer arrests could lead to more homicides, but it's also the case that more homicides could lead to more arrests through enhanced enforcement. The city has a homicide problem, and the police are told, get out there and do something about it, up your arrest tallies. Or it could be that homicides could lead to fewer non-homicide arrests through resource reallocation. We got a homicide problem, we want you to lay off a little bit on these other, like property crimes, uh, uh, we need to redouble our efforts uh, for the homicide problem. Joel and I are now working on ways to tease apart these different causal effects, but I want to make it clear that what we found so far is an association between the change in property crime arrests and the change in homicide. We're not yet prepared to make a strong causal claim about that relationship. We need other measures of proactive policing in addition to arrests which we had them for a large number of police departments. Uh, and then there are other hypotheses, and I think this will lead nicely into Shaitir Agastin's uh, comments. Um, it could be that it's not the police so much that are disengaging from communities. It's communities, uh, historically, that have had tense relationships with the police, disengaging even further from the police less likely to report crimes to the police, less likely to cooperate in investigations, perhaps more likely to engage in private vengeance to solve disputes. That also could be contributing to the homicide increase. And then there's the opioid epidemic we discussed this morning. Expanding drug markets, in other words, more 
buyers coming into the market and entices more sellers into the market. These social spaces can be quite violent on occasion, and there is some evidence that uh, drug-related homicides sort of led the way in the homicide increase in 2015. More on that uh, uh, during discussion and perhaps in Shaitiera's comments. All of these, uh, these uh, PowerPoint presentations will be up on the website, right? Yeah. Yep. So they're available to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. That's uh, really fascinating. One of the things that he brought up was um, the idea of perception. If you ask people today whether they believe that there has been a decrease in violent crime, most of the time they'll tell you, no, I don't think so. They, because of press, because of television. Right now we're going through a ratings period war uh, in television, where audiences have just left television, they've gone to uh, over-the-air television broadcast, they've gone to cable, they've gone to um, laptops, uh, they record, and so the audience numbers have dropped so drastically that television stations are in the midst of this uh, tremendous war. And if you see, on most stations now, there's this, these banners of breaking news. That's all you see, breaking news, breaking news. It's all over the country. As these consultants have told news directors that in order to increase your audience, you should let the audience feel that you are on top of news. So you see these banners of breaking news, developing story, all of this to try and give you an immediacy of what's going on right now. And so the audience now feels that crime is on the increase, that um, and we are now doing so many violent crimes now because murders are the perfect news story. You can get a reporter out to the scene of a, of a shooting or violent crime, put, stand them up in front of a <laughs> yellow police tape, flashing blue lights, they can talk for a minute and a half, and then it's back to you. So. In that respect, uh, in my book, Murder in the News, I've sent out questionnaires to the gatekeepers in newsrooms, who are the assignment editors and the producers, and had them fill out questionnaires discussing this very, this very same topic. They are the people who are the ones who are assigning the crews to the neighborhoods. Ironically, it, it all goes back to um, a gut feeling that these gatekeepers have. If a black teenager on the west side is a gang member and he's shot, we may not even cover that story because there are so many of them. But if you took that same kid, put some books under his arm, and had him walking to school when he was shot, we'd have helicopters in the sky because of a perception that that kid is more important. And so this whole idea of where we send the crews, where they go, all uh, was, I looked at talking to the assignment editors and producers. If you had a shooting in Times Square and you had a shooting out in the neighborhood and you have one crew, where are you gonna send that crew? You're gonna send the crew to Times Square, of course. It all goes back to the feeling that we cover the unusual, the important, and that sort of thing. So with that said, we'll get into Shatira Gaston, who is the uh, assistant professor in the Department of Criminal Justice at Indiana University in Bloomington. Good afternoon, post lunch. All right, I want to spend most of my time um, addressing two possible contributors to the homicide rises in 2015 and 2016. But before doing so, I want to summarize uh, the increases that we saw in the last couple of years. Uh, the homicide rises in 2015 and 2016 were large, relatively large, and unexpected. Um, it interrupted decades long declines in homicide rates at the national level. Uh, this aroused a concern amongst the public and public, official, uh, public officials about whether we were seeing a reversal in homicide rates. Um, uh, it's important to remember that although we've seen large increases in homicides in the last couple of years, that they are still among historic lows. However, given the, the nature and the extent of these uh, large increases, they are of concern and worth um, inquiry. As Rick pointed out, we haven't seen a, a, a one-year homicide rate increase this large since 1968. Um, in 1968, 
Dr. Dr. King was assassinated. Um, it was also a time period of a lot of civil unrest and a lot of uh, tensions between the community and the police, particularly communities of color and the police. Uh, the 2015 and 2016 homicide rises occurred irrespective of race. Uh, so we see rises for non-Hispanic non whites, um, non-Hispanic blacks, and Hispanics and Latinos on the offending and the victimization side. And also, it's important to note, as Rick pointed out, we also saw a growth at the national level in drug-related homicides. Um, I'll also point out something that was important, that there's variation at the city level where some cities saw increases that were large or modest, and other cities that didn't see any increases at all. Um, many of the cities that saw the large uh, increases were cities already experiencing high levels of violence, as well as high levels of socioeconomic disadvantage, and in many cases, uh, high tensions between the police and the community. So the burning question for a lot of folks is what caused this homicide rise? And I'll give you a quick um, answer that, to adjust your expectations that at this point, um, we criminologists don't have definitive answers to this question given um, the slow availability of data we need to, uh, to study these issues and also the lengthy uh, research process. So it could take years before we can get definitive answers. However, unfortunately, we have a large and substantiated research literature on crime trends so we can draw from past homicide rate changes and make some associations or draw some um, hypotheses based on recent social changes. So there are two social changes that happened that were contemporaneous with the homicide rate increases, and that was the opioid and heroin epidemic as well as um, the highly publicized and controversial police killings of unarmed African Americans. So I point to the uh, current drug epidemic and possible compromised police legitimacy as possible explanations to the homicide rise. Again, these are hypotheses that need to be tested with in, in, uh, rigorous empirical studies. So I'll first, uh, before I get to the drug epidemic, I do want to point out with homicide uh, rate changes, um, it's important to keep in mind that the predictors tend to be numerous, complex, and interactive. So it's highly unlikely that one issue is contributing to the homicide rise, and it's possible that an interaction of issues are contributing to the rise. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, now turn attention to the drug epidemic. Um, there's a large literature that links drug market activity to violent crime, especially homicide. Um, and this isn't just due to um, some drug users having a behavioral effect and may commit certain violent crimes in order to support a drug habit, but it's due to the systemic nature of drug markets, meaning that because drug markets, uh, illegal drug markets are illegal, participants, whether they be drug users, sellers, or, or, or manufacturers, can't go to the police to resolve uh, problems in a legal manner. As a result, uh, violent, violence is sometimes um, a primary so a source of informal social control used to regulate uh, drug markets. Uh, drug market participants uh, may settle disputes on their own and resort to violence to do so, and sometimes their violence turns lethal. Uh, violence is also used in drug markets to secure status and respect, uh, to enforce normative standards and codes, to protect and fight over drug turfs, to deter and avenge transgressions such as someone coming up short, um, uh, debts, uh, diluted products, drug-related robberies, etc. cetera. Um, there's uh, research showing that changing drug markets can exert impact on the homicide rate. And this was true um, in the late 1980s with the crack epidemic, which Al talked about. As crack markets expanded in the uh, late 80s, we also saw an increase in homicide. When crack markets declined in the early 90s, we saw decreases in homicide. So in other words, increases in drug market activity can provide more opportunities for disputes and selling disputes in violent ways that may become fatal violence. Uh, now turning to the compromised police legitimacy hypothesis. Um, so this uh, police crisis we're experiencing came amid the, uh, the homicide rise in 2015. Uh, the homicide, I'm sorry, the police legitimacy crisis comes from the civil unrest surrounding a string of highly publicized and controversial police killings of unarmed blacks um, starting in about 2014 with the Ferguson event. As a result of these highly publicized incidents, um, they may have uh, had the effect of compromising citizen views of the police 
um, stirring up distrust and perceptions of police illegitimacy. Uh, police legitimacy is an important crime inhibitor. Uh, we need it in order to help officers do their job well and in turn reduce crime. There's a long, over a century worth of research on governmental illegitimacy showing that when citizens view the government as illegitimate, crime is likely to occur. How does this work um, is the question. So illegitimacy, uh, those who perceive the police or government, governmental agencies as uh, illegitimate may be less inclined to follow the laws in their everyday life. Um, perceptions of police illegitimacy uh, shape a variety of public actions that help police behave uh, in a particular way and do their jobs well. Um, this is important because police rely heavily on citizens to do their, their jobs. Most of the crimes that become known to the police become known via citizens. Police rely on citizens for important information such, such as intelligence and rely on citizens to help uh, fight crime and to uh, punish criminals. Uh, when citizens, research shows that when citizens uh, view the police as illegitimate, illegitimate, they may be more likely to take conflicts into their own hands rather than relying on the police to resolve conflicts. Uh, they may be less likely to report crime to police or to call for help, uh, which will leave more criminals undetected and unpunished and at bay in communities. Also, when people uh, have perceptions of police Ill illegitimacy, they're less likely or maybe less willing to cooperate during investigations, uh, to provide intelligence to officers, to operate as witnesses, testify in court, and do all of those actions needed to help solve and control crime. Also, police legitimacy may result in uh, residents being less likely and less willing to, less willing to co-police their own communities, exerting informal social control, um, um, independent of police. Police legitimacy develops from and is maintained by procedural justice or procedurally just treatment. Therefore, these recent fatal force encounters and all of the, uh, the controversy surrounding it may have had the impact of impairing police legitimacy in, in inadvertently spiking crime rates and then seeing what we're seeing in 2015 and 2016. Again, these are hypotheses, not established facts. We need more empirical, rigorous empirical research to try to tease out some of these potential causal factors. I want to end on one note talking about um, a structural disadvantage and how it may serve to put particular places at a greater risk for homicide victimization, which may be the reason why we see so much variation at the city level. Um, research shows that uh, cities experiencing high levels of structural disadvantage may be particularly susceptible to uh, the relationship between drug market expansion and homicide, as well as police legitimacy and homicide as well. So that is something I want to end on, and I'll pick up I presume, in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shatier. Uh, our next speaker is Thomas Apt. Thomas is the uh, senior fellow with the Harvard Law School. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to do a bit of a sort of lightning round comments on uh, the great comments that our other speakers have done, and then I'm going to uh, make some sort of concluding observations uh, about this issue. So uh, I think uh, I think um, most. Serious observers and thinkers uh, agree with Al Bloomstein and uh, uh, disagree with Heather McDonald about this concept of a new nationwide crime wave. I think, generally speaking, the way to look at the increase in homicide, which has been significant over uh, uh, two years, is that it's cause for concern, but not panic. I think that's probably the best way to frame it. Um, I would, uh, I would respectfully, respectfully disagree with Professor Bloomstein that there's no national explanation as uh, when we get to Professor Gaston's comments, I'll, I'll weigh in on, on that. But I do think that there are, we have some su strongly suggestive evidence about what was happening nationally. Uh, I'm skeptical about, the, uh, about explanations that are based on anecdotal uh, evidence, such as the cops are telling me that there's increased firepower the cops are telling me that these gangs are more, less organized or that the, the, these, uh, these kids are uh, more lethal. 
I call these the kids these days arguments, or guns these days, or gangs these days. It's a very natural human influence. It's often basically just taking things that you hear uh, from cops anecdotally uh, and, uh, and sort of relying on them too heavily. We all have our war stories. Unless they're backed up by data, I'm inclined not to put a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, weight behind them. And there's not a lot of good evidence about the changes in the lethality of weapons, the, change, uh, the changes in the structures of gangs. If anything, as gangs have gotten less uh, organized, violence has dropped precipitously. So if anything, there's, a, there's a, uh, uh, the opposite relationship. Um, and so th just something to sort of keep in mind uh, as we move forward. Um, as uh, Professor Ro Rosenfeld, uh, I think, pretty uh, persuasively pointed out, this depleasing uh, argument, this sort of uh, Ferguson effect, as uh, McDonald coined it, uh, is, uh, is weakly supported, if at all. And I think, really, it's a, if it's a story anywhere, it's a story in Chicago and Baltimore, Baltimore and almost nowhere else. There's actually been some uh, literature uh, specifically looking at uh, St. Louis and Ferguson and Missouri which shows the exact opposite, that the depleasing had an in, uh, was related to less crime, not more crime. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, and this relates to uh, Professor Ferguson and Professor Gaston, I'm skeptical of this, uh, of the opioids as a cause for the, uh, a, uh, or a partial cause for the increase in homicide over these two years. The first thing is, I don't see this as a contemporary in increase. Uh, I think that, you know, and as Professor, Professor Rosenfeld has noted uh, in the past, the, the, opio the opioid uh, epidemic was with us for years before the homicide uh, rates started rising. And there may be explanations that we can get to in the, uh, in the discussion, but I think that that's an important point. The other thing is that a lot of the literature that is associating uh, the drug trade with violence, I think it's extremely outdated. This is all based on the crack wars of the late 80s and 90s. The drug trade does not function that way, and particularly the uh, market for opioids, uh, I think, uh, does not function uh, uh, that way to that extent. And so I think we have to really take a hard look at that literature and, and, and think about whether it really informs what's going on today with cell phones, with delivery services, and all these different things. The concept of this open air drug market where dealers are violently competing, I think that's largely a relic of the past, and thankfully so, but it complicates that explanation. Uh, I do think that this, uh, this concept of the legitimacy effect is a powerful one. Uh, and this is based on this notion of legal cynicism that when communities feel that law enforcement is either unable or unwilling to help them, they turn inward. And uh, uh, talking, uh, and you know, that's manifested in all the different behaviors that Professor uh, Gaston uh, talked about. Uh, but one that, uh, that she didn't mention is this notion of self-reliance or self-help. And this is one of those very cl clinical terms that criminologists use to describe a very real street phenomenon, which is if your cousin gets beat up, you don't call the police, you call your boys. And you go out and handle it, often violently so, and that triggers those violent cycles of retribution. And, and, you know, and a beating leads to a shooting, a shooting leads to a killing, and so on and so, so, on and, so forth. and so I think that that legitimacy effect is really the most plausible explanation among many for what we've seen. I think it matches up nicely with the timing. I think it match matches up nicely with the geography of where uh, the spikes were uh, greatest, not perfectly, but I think that that's a big part of what's happening. So that said, I wanna make some comments um, more generally about this issue. And You know, this notion of crime trends is worthwhile, and I'm glad we're having it, but I think its importance is somewhat overstated. And the reason for that is because homicidal violence is not a new problem. It's an old problem. And it's not an acute problem. It's a chronic problem. Americans are outliers when it comes to murder. We, kill, uh, we are killed at a rate seven times higher than in any other high-income country. 
and that's driven by a gun homicide rate that's 25 times higher than any other high-income country. And as Philip Roth describes in his book, American Homicide, Americans have suffered from these comparatively high rates of homicide since the, at least the beginning of the 20th century. So we've been outliers for a long time. Now, trends, particularly bad ones, uh, capture our attention because our brains, our prehistoric brains, predispose us towards information that's new or that's negative. And the media knows this and they act accordingly. They need to get, they need to you know, sell their advertising, they need their clicks, they need their views, so on and so forth. And one of the challenges with that is that these issues increasingly are framed as arguments to be won and not as problems to be solved. And that makes solving these problems much harder. Uh, and so you see these issues as political footballs. Uh, progressives are gonna play down perceived increases in violent crime because they worry that the, fear, the public's fear of violence is gonna undermine their reform agenda uh, and derail it. <laughs> Conservatives play up the fears, engaging in uh, demagoguery and fear mongering, using terms like American carnage to further their own political goals. And our current conversation is really oversimplifying this con these complex issues. It's emphasizing blame over responsibility, and it's encouraging deadlock instead of progress. And we need to move from this argument-winning posture to this problem-solving posture. Uh, and you know, I wasn't planning to talk about mass shootings, but given what happened yesterday in Parkland, it seems impossible not to. So if you look at this issue specifically just about mass shootings, you can see the problem. Uh, the framing of the debate on mass shootings is generally all about federal gun control legislation. And the benefits of such legislation are often oversold or, and the costs are exaggerated as well. And I am all in favor of common sense restrictions on gun ownership, but based on the evidence, I don't believe that that legislation could solve this problem overnight. And also, perhaps more realistically, we know that meaningful gun control simply will not be passed by Congress anytime soon. So, does that mean we just throw up our hands? I don't think so. While we deal with deadlock at a federal level, progress can be made at a state level. At least five states currently allow courts to seize guns from gun owners when they display dangerous behavior, but have not committed a crime or have not been legally found to be mentally incompetent. If Florida had had such a law, they would have been able to identify and maybe address uh, that shooter and get those guns uh, out of his hands. And also, let's keep in mind that it's not just government that can do something. The people in this room have power as well. And last year I signed on to a campaign called Don't Name Them, and that asked law enforcement and the media to follow four simple rules when it comes to publicly discussing mass killings. Number one, don't use the perpetrator's name. Number two, don't show their picture. Number three, don't use the names or pictures of previous uh, mass killers. And four, do everything else the way you normally would. This campaign is based on sound evidence that shows that mass killers often seek media coverage, that they compete with other killers to maximize casualties, and that media coverage of killers leads to con contagion and copy, uh, copycat effects. We already do this in other areas. The media doesn't show when guys run onto the football field because it encourages more people to run onto the football field. And we don't publish the names of sexual assault victims. So I just wanna ask all of you, by a show of hands, who here is ready to play their part in reducing mass killing? Who will, who will sign up to that? Excellent, now let me ask you this. Maybe some of you are not ready to come in. Who will bring this up with their editors and discuss this policy? Show of hands. Excellent, great. And then finally, I just wanna note that let's not forget that mass shootings receive a hugely disproportionate amount of public attention given the number of homicides. They, they account for less than 1% of all gun violence deaths. And the, really, the reality is that in America, we don't have one gun violence problem. We have four gun violence problems. And in descending order of number of deaths, number one is suicide. Massive number amount of deaths, the number one victim in those cases is older white men. Number two, 
uh, is urban homicides. And the number one victim there is young men of color. Number three is domestic violence. The number one victim there are women. And only last is, is homicide, uh, is mass killings, which really is only on the list because it has such a, such a horrible, shocking, shocking effect. So while, we're, while I'm talking about mass shootings right now, we should always be mindful that these other three problems cause many, many more deaths, and they need to receive a greater share of the media uh, and public's attention. Uh, that's enough for now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Very good. We uh, have uh, just a few moments left before our time is up. Uh, I might mention to uh, Professor App that knowing assignment editors as I do, the mass shootings that take place in schools or in our public areas will always uh, get uh, team coverage just because they are the nature of the, the crime that is committed. And uh, that's not likely uh, to change at all. Um, you know, you talk to people about the kinds of stories they cover, they say, well, you know, we cover the plane crashes, not the fact that, you know, so many thousands of planes take off safely every day. Well, that's true, but more thought needs to be given into the types of stories that are covered because of this whole idea of perception. Perception is very important. I've seen it play out many times in how police departments react to some cases as opposed to others. And it goes, it starts with the mayor who calls in the police superintendent and rings him out and he calls in his captains and they call in their lieutenants and it goes downhill until it gets right out to the, to the street people and um, it's felt. And uh, in those cases, you get results because they are sometimes rewards that take place in high profile cases and not rewards that take place in other cases. So there is a clear distinction in how the media treats some stories and not others. And that whole perception moves out into the general public and it causes us to feel uh, the way we do about some stories versus others. So let's, um, let's see if we can put some questions in with our remaining time. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, I've, I've been waiting. <laughs> Rick knows I've been waiting for a year to ask any questions because I haven't had it in a room where I could do this. So, for, um, yeah, no, not in the last year. Um, so the question I've got for, for uh, Rick and Professor Gaston, because I didn't hear you, um, Al, so I don't know what you can say. So, first of all, to the reporters, we ta I talked this morning about the challenge with reporting all this stuff is it's complicated. So we talk about the homicide rates, what you've been talking about is 53 large cities aggregated data. I think that you know my my working hypothesis is is that you've got to look at each city because it's too complicated to look and find a national answer. That you've got to look at what's happening in each place. So um, my question for you is in the 53 cities, and 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 depending on what the homicide rate was before, you know if you only had two, you said you had minimum 20, but. Um, there are a couple of cities that can drive the aggregate rate up. So do you have any information on the disaggregated information and what you might learn from that? Uh, yes, well, uh, you know, I should point out that we did look at 53 individual cities and measured uh, the arrest rates and the homicide rate changes in each of those cities. Now, but um, have we looked uh, in any intensive way uh, at each of the 53 cities? No, that's our next step because what we really need to do, among other things, is tease out the causal links in this relationship between crime and arrest. And that's a long, as Al knows, <laughs> he's part of the early debates, that's a long standing issue. Um, but uh, no, I quite agree with you, and, and it, it, that goes to a point that Al made, that in many of these cities there are local level circumstances that are not commonly shared. I also agree with Tom that there are some common themes that run through much of this. Let me just say one thing. Uh, Tom raises the important point, is there really a connection between the opioid epidemic and the homicide rise? The time lag is um, intriguing, right? Um, and so let me propose a couple of things. The biggest jump in homicide in 2015 was in drug-related homicide. 
it went up over 20%. Other felony homicides went up between 4 and 5%. Non-felony <coughs> homicides not connected with the commission of another felony went up between 3 and 4%. But it happened in 2015, some years after the rise in opiate-related deaths, you know, and the epidemic began. That could be because of the changing nature of the drugs and the dynamics of those markets. Early in the epidemic, it was, you know, to put it quite simply, and drawing on some of the conversation this morning, a pill-based epidemic. But for many, many users for whom uh, it was increasingly costly uh, to obtain their Oxycontin or their Vicodin uh, on the street, they learned that on a dose-for-dose -dose basis, heroin was cheaper. Uh, um, and um, as they entered the heroin market, that's when I think we began to see the violence. One final point. It's not simply that homicides went up among African Americans, as Shaitiera pointed out. Homicide rates also increased among whites, both offending rates and victimization rates. I have a very hard time applying the police legitimacy or the depolicing narrative to the increase in homicide among whites. A somewhat easier time to apply uh, the drug market hypothesis to the increase among whites because that drug epidemic has been disproportionately concentrated in the white population. I'm wondering if we don't have an issue with nomenclature here when it comes to how we classify certain murders as drug related. Because right now, the gangs uh, are so busy with retaliation that crimes uh, are taking place, and we tend to want to say drug-related when it refers to gangs instead of gang-related when it refers to gangs. And so I'm wondering if that's an issue, if anyone has any thoughts on that. Well, just one quick thought. Uh, these, the data come from the FBI supplementary homicide reports. Al drew on them in his presentation. I don't think any of us is going to devote a great deal of time or attention to defending the overall validity of those classifications. They come from the Uniform Crime Reports that attempts to apply uniform common classification rules across police departments. The drug-related homicide uh, trend comes from SHR data that connects the homicide to, quote, the violation of narcotic drug laws. There are additional categories for gang-related homicide, both youth gang and what they call gangland, meaning more traditional adult gang homicide. And there are, you know, there are intimate partner homicides, there are other categories as well. I would not devote a lot of time to defending um, just how precisely and how accurately those, cate those categorizations are applied. I do think, though, that if you look over time at the same categorizations, you're in a somewhat stronger ground to argue that you know one category of crime has gone up while others haven't. But you're quite right. Uh, this is a tough business, and not all police departments do it in the same way. I want to keep you. Uh, we still have time. So if we can do a, a quick round robin of questions. Yes. Anyone? So make your questions as short as you can, please. Yes, yes, there, yes, you, have, you have the mic right there? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Anat. I'm a fellow with the journalists here. Um, I have a question about recommendation for policymakers. Um, would you recommend, close to all of you, going back to the broken window policy, um, considering it may cause further loss of trust among communities towards law enforcement? The broken window effect. Uh, before you answer, that's a good question. Is that anyone in particular or all? Uh, he and I were just discussing. Um, <coughs> he and I were just discussing if uh, loss of police legitimacy has driven an increase in homicide. I mean, when when would it not have driven? I mean, it, it seems um, like there has been a lack of legitimacy. Yeah. Everybody hear that question? <coughs> we were talking about the uh, legitimacy, the police. And we were kind of wondering anecdotally, well, when has there ever been legitimacy in certain communities? So if that's a contributor to the spike, 
I wonder well, why would crime have ever gone down? That'd be a good piece of information. Sam, I don't think we heard your question. Did you answer your question? Oh, it's not something that's in the UCR. We have one, one question here and one over there. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the broken windows. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of controversy surrounding uh, broken windows, but there has been an authoritative report by the National Academy of Sciences that's been released, as well as a Campbell uh, systematic review. And the evidence basically shows that uh, broken windows is not a good strategy or a bad strategy inherently. It's not inherently racist. It's not inherently effective. It's really about how it's applied. And basically, when broken windows is done in a way that's targeted, focused, and in collaboration with the community, it not only reduces crime more effectively, but it also has no community resistance. However, when broken windows is just an excuse for zero tolerance, aggressive order maintenance policing, then it's not effective. We have to get out of this broken windows thumbs up or thumbs down, it really is as applied. And basically what I would say is if you need a national plan or a city plan, you need to do, uh, you need to basically do three things. You need to focus on your hot spots, the uh, crime concentrations in space. You need to focus on your impact offenders, that very small number of offenders who may congregate around those places. And you need to focus on a few key behaviors, things like gang or group membership, uh, gun possession, and interestingly, uh, drinking of alcohol much more so than other, uh, other drugs. All right, I like your question about what's different today than ever, uh, especially since um, at least one study shows there has not been an increase in police killings of black civilians over time. Um, so the big difference between uh, now and in the past is that we have social media and we have people filming these interactions, these murders on their cell phones and then widely display displaying them over social media, which basically uh, broadcast these issues all over the world at a very high rate of speed. Um, and then also the success of public, uh, publication of these uh, news stories as well. So there was like a string of stories being told back to back for the past, oh, for a period of two to three years. So that's the big difference. Good question. Okay. I think, yeah, I think that uh, we, we are, we've run out of time. So uh, we'd like to thank our panel. Uh